My book, Off-Grid Solar Power Simplified, was featured in a TV series, Earth Abides. In team with the TV show, I will show you how to design a reliable solar system for your off-grid cabin. This is a sneak peek of the system we are going to build. I will cover this system in these 10 easy to follow steps. By the end of the video, you will know how to design a system that powers your fridge, lights and other essentials year round. Let's get started. Step 1 in building an off-grid solar system is figuring out how much energy you will need each day. This is crucial because your batteries and panels depend on this calculation. Start by listing all the appliances you will use in the cabin, their power rating in watts and how many hours you'll run them each day. Here's an example for a typical setup. Here we have a fridge, TV, some lights, a microwave and a laptop. Don't forget to include the inverter's idle consumption. This is something most people forget. Multiply the power rating by the hour used to get watt hours. Add all of them up and we get a total energy consumption of 2700 watt hours per day. Now that we know our daily energy consumption, the next step is to size the battery bank. This ensures your system has enough storage to keep your cabin powered, even on cloudy days. In an off-grid setup, I recommend sizing your battery for 3 days of autonomy. That means the battery can supply power for 3 full days without sunshine. Here's how we calculate it. We have a daily power consumption of 2700 watt hours and multiply it with 3 days to become 8100 watt hours. If we want to find out the amp hours of the battery, we use the following formula. 8100 watt hours divided by the nominal voltage of the battery bank, which is 51.2 volts, equals 158 amp hours. So, we need a battery that can store at least 158 amp hours at 48 volts. Using a 48 volt system helps reduce wire size and keep the charge controller more affordable. Large batteries can be heavy and hard to handle. For example, a single 48 volt 280 amp hour battery weighs 300 pounds or 136 kilograms. Not something you want to move on your own. Instead, I recommend splitting the storage in smaller, more manageable batteries. These two 48 volt 100 amp hour batteries in parallel give you 200 amp hours of storage. They're easier to handle, weighing about 82 pounds or 37 kilograms each. These batteries have Bluetooth monitoring and cold temperature protection. With the battery bank sized and selected, the next step is figuring out how much solar power we need to recharge them. To size the solar panels, we need to match the battery's daily energy use with the amount of sun hours available at your location. For this example, let's say the cabin is in Hockton, Michigan, near Lake Superior. Using my free solar panel tilt calculator, which I will link in the description, we can see that we need to tilt the panels at a 45 degree angle. Using a tool called PV Watts, which is free to use, we find that the average sunlight hours are the lowest in December with just 1.38 hours per day. Remember that sun hours is not the same as daylight hours. One sun hour equals 1000 watts per square meter, while daylight varies and might be 600 watts per square meter. To avoid oversizing the system for winter, we'll plan to use a generator during November, December and January. For the rest of the year, We'll design the system based on 3 daily sun hours. Let's do some math. Remember, we had our daily consumption with 3 days of autonomy. We need to recharge this amount of battery in 1 day with 3 sun hours. The formula goes as follows. 
8100 watt hours divided by 3 sun hours equals 2700 watts of solar panels. If we use 415 watt panels, which I will link in the description, we need 6.5 panels. Let's round down to 6 panels. This keeps the system simple and efficient. In the next section, I will show you how to wire these panels and size the charge controller. One tip for cabins in snowy areas. I recommend using a ground mount system. It's easier to remove snow from the panels compared to roof mounted systems. With the solar panels sized, the next step is to wire them correctly and choose the right charge controller. We are using 6 415 watt panels. The best configuration for this setup is wiring two strings of three panels in series, then connecting those strings in parallel. Here's why. Each panel has a VOC of 37.75 volts. With three panels in series and an extra safety factor, the maximum voltage becomes 141 volts. This keeps us below the 150 volt limit of most charge controllers, even in cold temperatures when voltage increases. Let's calculate the maximum current the charge controller needs. 2700 watts of solar panels divided by the nominal battery voltage of 51.2 volts equals 53 amps. To handle 2700 watts of solar power, I recommend the Victron 150 volt 60 amp charge controller. It supports 150 volt input and 60 amps output. Perfect for our setup. Oversizing slightly ensures the controller doesn't overheat or lose efficiency under heavy loads. Use a 20 amp inline MC4 fuse for each string to protect against overcurrent. Install a 60 amp DC breaker or disconnect near the charge controller. This lets you safely cut power from the panels during maintenance. Since the wire from the solar panels is 50 feet, we need to do a voltage drop calculation. If the wire is too small, we will lose voltage along the way, which will reduce the system's efficiency. Let's calculate the voltage drop of a 50 foot wire between the solar panels and the charge controller. With three panels in series, multiply the VMP, the voltage at maximum power, for each panel by three. This becomes 95 volts. For two parallel strings, calculate the maximum current using the short circuit current, or ISC, and the safety factor of 1.56. This becomes 44 amps. Using these values in a voltage drop calculator, we find that 8 gauge or 10 mm square solar PV cable is required to keep the voltage drop under 3%. Now that the panels and charge controllers are sorted, let's move on to wiring the charge controller to the battery. Let's calculate the wire and fuse size from the charge controller to the battery. To size the wire, we need to calculate the maximum current the charge controller can deliver. The Victron 150 60 amp delivers 60 amp maximum. So we have to add a 1.25 safety factor, which brings the current to 75 amps. We will need a fuse rated close to 75 amps. An 80 amp marine rated battery fuse will work well. Now we need to select a wire that can carry at least 80 amps. A 6 gauge or 16 mm square welding cable rated for 105 degrees Celsius insulation temperature is sufficient. I recommend installing a shunt on the main battery negative. This acts like a fuel gauge showing the state of charge for your battery. Here's how to connect it. Run the battery negative cable through the shunt B-. The other side of the shunt becomes your system's main negative connection. Add a small wire 
with a 1 amp fuse to power the shunt display. With the batteries and charge controller wired, the next step is to add the inverter. For this system, I recommend the Victron MultiPlus 48V 3000VA inverter. Here's why. It's a low frequency inverter, meaning it handles surges, like when your fridge starts up, with ease. It's reliable, quieter than a hybrid inverter, and has low standby power consumption of only 11 watts. It includes an integrated battery charger for the generator. Connect the positive terminal of the inverter to the main battery positive and the negative terminal to the shunt. Let's calculate the size of the fuse and the cable going to the inverter. The maximum current the inverter can draw from the batteries is 3000 watts divided by 48 volts equals 62.5 amps. Multiplying with a safety factor of 1.25 we become 78 amps. A marine rated battery fuse close to this current is 80 amps and the cable that can carry at least 80 amps is 6 gauge or 16 mm square welding cable rated at 105 degrees celsius. This is the same fuse rating and cable thickness than the charge controller. We will use the same cable thickness and fuse on the other battery in parallel. During winter, solar alone may not provide enough energy, so a small generator is a great backup. I recommend the Champion 2200 Watt Inverter Generator, which is affordable and reliable. Here's how to fit it in the system. Run the AC output of the generator directly to the AC input of the Victron MultiPlus inverter charger, using a 10 gauge or 6 mm square cable. The MultiPlus can charge the batteries at 35 amps, which translates to 1800 watts. This is within the generator's capacity. Let's calculate how long it would take to recharge our 10 kWh battery with a generator. 10 kWh divided by 1800 watts equals 5.5 hours. Let's say it takes 6 hours including inefficiencies. So it would take 6 hours to fully recharge your battery. Let's take a look at how to wire the AC distribution board. The inverter has a maximum output of 3000 watts at 120 volts, which equates to a current of 25 amps. We then apply a safety factor of 1.25. I recommend using a 32 amp breaker with a ground fault current interrupter. Today you can find combined GFCI and breaker units like this one. For the AC output wiring, use a 10 gauge or 6 mm square cable with lugs to connect the inverter to the AC distribution box. Inside the AC distribution box, install a 20 amp breaker to handle all your cabin loads. This is sufficient because the highest power draw in the system is the microwave at 1400 watts, which calculates to a power draw of 12 amps. To connect your appliances, you can use an extension cord with power strip and cut one end to fit into the 20 amp breaker. You can use a 12 gauge or 4 mm square wire after the 20 amp breaker and wire to the sockets around the cabin. You can have another breaker for powering your lights as well. With the inverter, generator and AC distribution box connected, the last step is ensuring proper grounding and safety. Grounding is one of the most important aspects of an off-grid system. It ensures safety, protects you and your equipment, and keeps you compliant with electrical standards. For the DC side, connect all grounding points, such as a charge controller and inverter case, to a grounding bus bar. Then connect this to the main battery negative. Only make this connection once. So all the DC equipment grounding goes to the grounding bus bar, and then 
one wire goes to the negative battery terminal. This is what is called bonding, used to bring all the equipment cases to a zero reference signal so there are no stray voltages. On the AC side, connect the grounding wire from the AC out of the inverter to the grounding bus bar in your AC distribution box. Connect the frame of your solar panels to the AC grounding bus bar as well. From there, run a grounding wire to a grounding rod. I recommend keeping AC and DC grounding separate. Place the grounding rod in moist soil, if possible. Avoid rocky or dry locations, as they reduce the effectiveness of grounding. When we add the generator on the AC side, it brings in another ground neutral bond. Because the generator has a ground neutral bond inside of it, we only want one neutral ground bond. So, we have to disconnect the ground to neutral bond. The Victron Multiplus handles the neutral ground bond internally. When operating in inverter mode, it automatically bonds the neutral and ground inside with a relay. When the generator is connected, it switches to the generator's neutral ground bond to avoid double bonding. For added safety, I recommend using a GFCI or ground fault current interrupter for your AC loads. This protects against ground faults and minimizes the risk of electrical shock. This unit has a GFCI and a breaker in one. If you want more details about grounding, ground neutral bond and GFCI protection, I recommend watching my three-part series on this subject. With the grounding complete, your system is now safe and ready to use. Let's go over the cost of this system. This is the cost of all the components used in the system. For about $6,000, you will have a reliable, year-round off-grid solar system capable of powering your cabin's essential appliances. I have linked all the components in the video description. I will also add the system to the library of off-grid solar power systems on my website, so you can see it there as well. Here is the complete diagram. Is there something you would change for this system? Let me know your suggestions in the comments below. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like and consider subscribing if you like my videos. If you want a deeper dive into off-grid solar power systems, check out my book Off-Grid Solar Power Simplified, featured on the TV series Earth Abides. It's the first link in the description. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one.